Within a very short time following its release, Dishonored 2 faded into the shadows of the growing AAA gaming pantheon given its horrendous launch. Like many, I shelved it, frustrated, and vowed only to revisit it when it was fixed. And when I came back to it a staggering five years later, I discovered something I never expected to find. The mansion has a strange beauty to it, but all such places must eventually come to ruin. Dishonored 2 tells the continuing story of Emily Caldwin, now Empress of Dunwall, beset by a sudden appearance of her aunt Delilah who strips her of her throne. The player then chooses to play as Emily or Corvo in a twist, which was one of the things I initially didn't think much of, but later on added incredible amounts of replayability, since they have two entirely different sets of powers. They also have unique dialogue during many story scenes, when discovering secrets and when interacting with certain characters. As a bonus, they also have minor differences in combat animations and also the way they run. Emily is far better voiced than her gruff old father, and her powers are fresh and badass, so I chose to play as Emily for this playthrough. Either way, I ended up playing through the game again, right away, as Corvo, to get a low chaos experience, and saw enough differences in dialogue, non-player interactions, voice lines, environmental alterations, and of course endings that made it feel almost like a brand new experience. It can be subtle, but most of the differences are very evident, like stumbling on a woman who hung herself in a dilapidated, bloodfly-infested room. This doesn't exist if you play Low Chaos. It's not just smoke and mirrors, this adds a great deal of world building, something that was already very well developed with the original, and was at a large cost to Arcane. This is just one area that has taken a great something from Dishonored 1 and just simply made it better. The entire world is like this, taking what were once small, dense, very brown maps, full of great player flow and detail of course, but supercharging them into expansive, beautiful locations crammed with even more detail and routes for the player to explore. It can't be overstated how awesome and unique the setting of Dishonored was, but Dishonored 2? Simply far more varied, modern, and detailed. We're talking about an absolutely exponential amount of improvement. A lot of darker themed games like Dishonored don't go for sunnier coastal locations. Dunwall was beautiful in its own way and there's a great draw to it, but it's not like another dimly gray-brown game would suffice. Karnaka and the places you explore in Dishonored 2 are injected with such vibrancy, they're so visually fresh, even though the game has the same amount of gloominess in many of its interior-focused levels, like the Royal Conservatory, where Emily has to track down Brianna Ashworth. It's here, in this sort of creepy haunted house, that we run into the game's second enemy type, the Witches, which provide an additional layer of gothic horror into the mix. Don't let anyone fool you, this game is still dark and sully in these moments, and even more outer-worldly than the first. Sift and four hands blend. Make the pigments block the wind. Fingers stained blue and blush. Conjure rainbows for her brush. But the spaces in between are light rays, beautiful colors, and rolling waters set upon the backdrop of enchanting skyboxes. Dunwall was great, but Karnaka is so much more. Arcane really outdid themselves with this honor too. The levels are so amazing, so detailed and stylish, and the presentation is gorgeous. And I go so far to say that when I got to a crack in the slab, I thought it was one of the best video game levels I have ever played. You see, Dishonored 2 does something very important that so many games, including the first game by the way, fail to do. Mix it up. When you make a linear story game, you're not just building a story from A to Z. And you're not just building a series of levels that connect those points. You're building a story from A to Z that has a series of levels that connect those points that the player will be working through for A to Z hours. You really need to take the entire length of the game and slice out moments where things can change mechanically, thematically, or hopefully both at the same time. It's called mixing things up. Because when you surround a great mechanic with other things the player can do, it makes that mechanic even more enjoyable because the player can't always do it. Hence developing the feeling of exclusivity. Dishonored 2 does this beautifully again in a mission called A Clockwork Mansion. When players get to the fourth level of the game, they encounter one of the coolest level mechanics seen in modern games. 
Hitting switches transforms the mansion into new layouts before your very eyes. Folding, escalating, and changing rooms as you walk through them like you're some sort of puppet in a play. It's ingenious actually, and really makes you scratch your head how they were able to pull this off in real time. Not the least of which, allow players to control the transformation themselves. This level blew my mind. It really does pose a question, how good would Dishonored 2 be if every single level featured this mechanic? Sure, it loses its charm pretty quick when you replay it, as the wonderlust vanishes and you discover the mansion is really quite small by itself. But the simple fact that the mansion is such a consistent experience with all of its transformations and different paths, allowing players to flip switches in clever ways to reach bone charms and runes with their powers, was simply magical. This level shines not just because it's individually amazing, but because it breaks up the core gameplay, which is something we really need to do if we're going to get players to remain interested and curious. It's called pacing, and it exists in many forms, including level design, variety, gameplay mechanics, etc. And again, Dishonored 2 does this once more with a crack in the slab, which I would argue is even more impressive for one reason. It elevates the core gameplay principle of Dishonored. By giving players a time travel device, we're bringing them into two different worlds that function in real time simultaneously, which is already really cool. You can imagine a game that allows players to snap into this reality and back to the other, but instead Arcane gives us a timepiece, which allows us to peer into that other world through its shards of glass. That also by itself is an incredible technical achievement in the sense that the game masks that secondary world such that you can see both at the same time. Essentially, Dishonored 2 has transformed the dark world from a link to the past into a real-time traveling simulator. It allows for simple interactions like getting past a locked door that exists in one world by traveling to the other world, where it didn't exist in that timeline. This one simple mechanic can be used in so many ways, and I personally spent a whole day in Stilton's Manor, seeing how far I could stretch the possibilities. And that's when I stumbled upon something that should have been quite obvious, that I could use the timepiece as a stealth device too. The timepiece isn't just a means to advance through the level you see, it can be used to approach enemies safely, set up elaborate killstreaks, or flee from danger. All things you could do normally with Emily's powers, but now you have even more flexibility. Talk about amplifying core gameplay mechanics, this is it. This level of game design would be something reserved for the final level in many other games, but in Dishonored 2, it's not even the halfway point. So what we have here beyond amazing level design is two perfectly placed sections of the story where brand new environmental gameplay mechanics are introduced to break up the monotony that the player may be feeling. This helps keep Dishonored 2 fresh in ways that the original did not, giving us that same great dense level design of the original with plenty of fresh air in between. In fact, every single mission, despite new mechanics or not, has three or more critical paths that can be utilized to get to objectives, offering total freedom in any playstyle the player has chosen. The game never forces you or encourages you to do anything, it simply supports you regardless of what powers you have. For example, here's an alternate path to bypass this wall of light. You see this pipe here? It was conveniently placed here because the game knows that some players will have chosen the no powers mode. Because without this pipe, you'd have to blink across to the other building. It's a very simple example, but the point is, the game always has the mindfulness to never exclude any type of player within its level design. My only gripe with the level design in Dishonored 2 was the last level feeling a bit underwhelming. All of the maps have plenty of options. Typically Dishonored 2 is never to the points or linear, but the last level felt like a little bit of a letdown, especially after it had unleashed its magnum opus, a crack in the slab. It was very clear that they were nearing deadlines and no more new mechanics or intricate level weaving could be introduced, which is a shame, as this is the very last level of the game.
Dishonored 2 also improves greatly upon the gameplay set in the original in many ways. One of the main issues and only issues I had with Dishonored 1 was the lack of stealth tools to make low chaos runs as attractive as aggressive gameplay, as there were more options and mechanics to play in high chaos. To be fair, stealth gameplay offers its own rewards, as it really feels great to go through a level without being seen, but that does require that feeling to come from within, since it doesn't give you as many tools or powers to deal with obstacles. Dishonored 1 had three ways to bypass or incapacitate enemies, which were chokeouts, sleep darts, or simply to avoid them, and there was next to zero crossover with other gadgets. This led to a sort of all-or-nothing experience, where you chose one style and you stuck to it. However, this all changed in Dishonored 2, which makes the action and the stealth gameplay much more expansive, much more interwoven, and much more improvisational. Dishonored 2's pistol can now be used non-lethally in two creative ways. First, enemies can be wounded with the pistol before being put in submission. Typically, you can do this by shooting the enemy in the leg to cripple them. This will place the enemy into a stagger state of sorts, similar to the effect of executing a parry, opening up a free window Emily can use to either kill them or choke them out for a non-lethal takedown. This technique can also be used with a crossbow. The pistol can also be used to blind enemies by shooting the space around the enemy's head. This will stun the enemy and place them into the same stagger-like state allowing Emily to once again follow up with a non-lethal takedown if she chooses. Neither of these mechanics are explicitly told to players or were possible in Dishonored 1. And they're very nice changes because they are mechanics that the player can use to keep engagements non-lethal while using lethal equipment, which allows them to retain their low chaos standing without feeling like they're being excluded. This is great not only for that reason, but more importantly makes the crossover of the two different chaos levels less cut and dry, which ultimately leads to a way more flexible rule set driven by those mechanics. Due to the improved AI, which now features much more unpredictability, it was crucial to give Emily more options in case she gets detected so players can keep their desired standing with the game, and this is one of those that does. Other mechanics were also added to expand non-lethal attacking. These include stun mines, a non-lethal air slam, and a slide KO, all of which are very satisfying to use and keep the momentum of the game flowing nicely. But again, more importantly, they open up more options for those who are playing stealth. Now, in addition to the combat tools, the powers have also been expanded to allow for various types of gameplay also. Emily has some of the best ones, like her Mesmerize or Domino abilities, both of which can be used to incapacitate groups of enemies or help her sneak by without being seen. Or kill them all at once if playing on a high chaos. Again, the choice is up to the player. I've never seen a sequel so dramatically elevate the core mechanics of a game. Across the board, everything has seen an enhancement from Dishonored 2. The melee combat itself has been given a huge facelift with a brutal, and I mean brutal, dismemberment system that showers the screen with blood as you execute your enemies. The facial animations are particularly awesome, eyes and tongues popping out of their sockets and their screams a chilling death cry. You really get the sense that you're not just killing someone in Dishonored 2, you're eviscerating them. It feels that intense, probably because the game loves to zoom in on the gory details, especially in slow motion. The game features dozens of new animations, stabs, thrusts, decapitations, kicks, slices and more, all pristinely done with the new slow motion death cam system. No way. Here, don't let him escape. And some of these attacks and powers can be used in combination at the same time, such as planting a sticky mine on a soldier while parrying his attack. The game has a lot of these very subtle optional mechanics that the player has to discover for themselves, and I actually appreciate that. Aside from the frame dips, which is a shame they do exist even five years later, the Total Combat experience is absolutely wonderful and I just had so much fun playing this game. I just wish that the story had a little bit more mystery to it, you know? As there aren't any twists and turns, not really any surprises either, and the game ends pretty much how you'd expect. It's your typical revenge story, whereas the original, it was more heavily focused on the politics of getting that revenge. So naturally, if things are going to be more simple this time around, we really need to develop that revenge arc. Delilah captures a great performance as the main villain, but lacks the screen time, though, to develop her thoroughly. The developers banked rather riskily on the idea that her backstory was already fleshed out in the Dishonored 1 DLC hedging her gravity on past player exposure or lack thereof, or that players would explore the optional notes and audio logs the second game provides. And I'm not too keen on setting it up this way, as we're not sure if the player has that prior knowledge or not, or is willing to do that. 
The notes and audio tapes help flesh things out, but naturally only to a minor degree. They're always going to be eclipsed by actual interactions, cutscenes, and moments of exposition that other games provide for their villains and heroes. As someone who has played all of the Dishonored content available, I felt Delilah to be very effective as a target revenge tool, but only because I had a relationship with the prior games. As such, I imagine she isn't particularly gripping or substantial for anyone who is just playing Dishonored 2 in isolation, so perhaps somewhat of a missed opportunity to not make her present felt more. Now onto the system side. Dishonored 2 improves upon the artificial intelligence, which was an area of somewhat disappointment in the original, although not nearly to the degree I would have preferred. Dishonored 1 had a fairly erratic AI system in place, guards being either somewhat oblivious to the player or hyper alert to the point of detecting Corvo far too easily. Their cones of vision just didn't seem to align with their behaviors when not seen half the time, so it was a little bit of a guessing game. And when they became alerts, pretty much all hell broke loose, every goddamn guard would aggro no matter how far away they seemed to be. That led to the classic stealth problem of not being able to re-enter stealth after you've dealt with the person who discovered you in the first place, forcing you to either kill everyone or just run away. It's important to have a clear detection system in a stealth game, obviously, so the player knows exactly where they stand. And Dishonored 2 is a little bit better in this regard as the game features better proximity detection, allowing Emily to alert a guard in one side of the room and deal with him without alerting the other guard in the other room. This is definitely a step in the right direction, but it is unfortunate that those AI guards have routes that aren't randomized to help spice up repeat playthroughs. Giving guards different routes based on what difficulty the player has selected doesn't really make sense when players will just find the difficulty that suits them and stick to it. They're not going to be swapping around, so it somewhat nullifies the effort. However, conditional behaviors are randomized a lot more, as enemies can react in completely different ways given the exact same scenario. The shooter has to be hiding over there! I wonder who that was. Can't stay hidden forever. Come on! I don't have time for games. <laughs> Coming from over there! Imagine that? No, I'm sure. Again, this isn't a huge technical feat when looking at the grand scope of gaming, but for the Dishonored franchise, it is a leap forward nonetheless. My favorite part about Dishonored 2 is just how much it improved the first game and how bold it is with its ambitions. It's a huge, beautiful game, with even better stealth, combat, animations, mechanics, details, voice work, cutscenes, and exposition. The game is so stylish and slick, you really feel like a master thief or a lethal assassin. It has some of the most incredible gameplay I've ever experienced, and the mechanics are so sophisticated, slick, and diverse, and above all else, they are just plain fun. Did you know you can slide under a sword slash in Dishonored 2? Yeah, it's little things like this that make this game feel really awesome. It also happens to have bold sound effects, a setting that I adore, great art design, and the perfect balance of openness and linearity that's something that very much suits me. And it pains me to think I let this game sit dormant for so many years, as I've enjoyed it so much, it really has become one of my favorite games of all time. Dishonored 2 is simply one of the best, creative, immersive simulations I have ever played, and I'm not shocked that I enjoyed it even more than the first game. That's because it's Dishonored on steroids, with all the great ideas of the original just blown completely out of the water, with improved graphics, scope, and lovely realized mechanics. There are so many combinations that create completely unique moments that led to playthroughs that felt really distinct, and your actions always have a profound impact on how everything plays out, from the story to the small details and how your character truly is. And one of my favorite things was watching how my character reacted to the people I killed. Watching Emily slowly become a sociopath was really immersive, and when she proclaimed Anton's corpse, what's another bag of bones? I felt myself smirking at what I had done. That's the kind of connection I want from what I do inside a game to what the game then shows me. The gameplay can be brutal, it could be sneaky, it could be whatever you want. That's the beauty of Dishonored 2, it gives you unparalleled freedom to create your own type of story through that gameplay. It's definitely not perfect. I mean, why is the setup the same for every single mission just like it was in the original? In replace of Samuel the boat rider, now we have Megan the boat rider. 
Come on guys, let's get with the times. Frame rate dips are a constant issue, crashing is still prevalent and some minor issues exist when trying to choke out guards that are not on the same elevation. I mean, what the hell's going on here? Lackeys and bureaucrats. Everything I do. Still, Dishonored 2 is simply an incredible advancement of the Dishonored mechanics, world design, player freedom, and so much more. And if you haven't tried it yet, you are missing one of the most immersive creative sims on the market. Mm -hmm.